I did wanted to ask you about uh, some of so, some of your influences in India, maybe, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, we were talking about this off camera. But uh, mm -hmm. the I mean, there are certain very very. Uh, I mean, it's always wrong to say that. Uh, uh, I mean, third world is a very bad generalization, mm -hmm. or now I mean, yeah, even global is. south or whatever. Absolutely. But uh, there are certain uh, convergences between uh, uh, both our nations in terms of the long history of uh, colonization by the British and also the fact that uh, we don't have one language, we have mm -hmm. several languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so uh, do, you have, do, you, do you, are you invested in, in, in exploring this, this relationship? And are there writers who, who, who you've admired and liked? And secondly, uh, who, are the, who, who are the writers you like in, in, the, in the languages which are written in Nigeria? And what, what is the relationship with writers like you who write in English? And that is a hydra-headed question. <laughs> Um, in terms of engagement, you know, I think it's it's interesting that uh, both Nigeria and India have had this history with the British. Uh, you know, I don't know. There's a reason why in Hollywood they want British villains for whatever reason. <laughs> but you know, um, Britain has had a history with with different countries. Um, in most cases, they are not good. Um, with, with Nigeria and India, for instance, right, and the generality of, of Africa, perhaps, you know, there's this interruption of the organic growth of, of these countries or places. Um, people had their history, they had their culture, they had their identity, uh, they had their ways of writing, and then suddenly the British came and by waving a flag and signing some very useless papers, they just said, well, your civilization and your histories are rubbish. Your ways of storytelling don't work. They are not good. You know, and suddenly people who are scholars and intellectuals overnight became illiterate. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened in, in Northern Nigeria that has a system of governance and a way of writing for, for centuries before the British came. And then all of a sudden, these people were illiterate, you know. So they have to learn a new language. They have to learn a new way of storytelling. They have to learn a new way of identifying themselves and situating themselves in the world. And, and this abuse happened for, for years, for centuries. So people have to kind of take a while to resituate and recalibrate their, their you know, their bearing. And, uh, find new ways of identifying themselves within this new context that was imposed on us. Um, so in that sense, India and Nigeria are very similar, in a very similar, very similar position, I guess, you know. And unfortunately, you have um, a situation where, where the means of validating the stories that you tell now are mostly situated in the West, in London and New York and places like that. Um, so if it doesn't conform to their standards, you know, it becomes a problem, which was where we had a problem with what people called um, poverty porn, you know, mm -hmm. which I understand is also a phenomenon in uh, South American literature and, and filmmaking as well. Uh, but they call it differently. They call it porn or misery, which is misery porn, um, where you have to project certain images in your literature. And if it doesn't confine to the uh, matrix that, that has already been set, then it's considered not good enough, which is very unfortunate. Um, but in, in that sense, India has uh, an advantage because it has a far more stronger publishing industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, Indians write their stories and tell their stories, and Indians consume it. You know, um, probably in far greater number than if it had been published in London or New York. Um, in terms of Indian literature, you know, uh, you come to a country through different ways. So this is my first time in India, mm -hmm. but I feel like I've been here because we've been inundated by a uh, cultural product from India, right? I mean, you have the Bollywood, which is one of the biggest in the world. Uh, fortunately, we have the Nollywood, which is <laughs> which is the next biggest in the world. So, so that's sort of um, good, I suppose. Um, but you have this projection from, from Bollywood, which may not be representative of 
the reality of majority of Indians, right? And people have to be discerning to understand, okay, this is a projection of a certain type of India. There are different types of Indians um, and different types of issues that they engage with. Um, and I, and I feel for me, literature offers more of that variety to a large extent. So who are the, who are the writers? That the writers, um, obviously, are in that Roy. Everybody loves her. Maybe. <laughs> I do. I mean, I love, I love The God of Small Things. It was, it was rich. It was, for me, it was, in a way, it's, it's a narrative that, is, um, that epitomizes India. Right. You know, it's rich and lush and colorful and fabulous. Um, Aravinda Dika for a counter narrative, which is, which is, um, you know, it gives you the other side that you don't see in Bollywood, uh, which I think is also brilliant. You know. And I wanted to talk about, uh, wanted you to talk about a little bit about uh, writers like you in who write in English, mm -hmm. and and your the relationship with the writing in other languages in Nigeria. Like I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the they seem to operate on parallel wavelengths. Right, but there are points of convergence where you know we meet at writers' conferences occasionally, and you talk, and you feel why well, yeah, there there should be more room for engagement. There should be translations, you know, into from English into local languages and from local languages into English, and um, you know there have been tentative conversations like that, but I don't feel it's been followed up and. Uh, but hopefully soon, you know. I mean, there's this uh, this fellow who is very passionate about translations into from Hausa into English, and um, I, I, I'm happy that I've helped him kind of linked him up with uh, writers from elsewhere, and he has translated some of their short stories into local languages. And I think that's a very good point to start, and I hope it develops further. In fact, it's not something that uh, is suddenly sort of taken a little more seriously, I'd, I'd say, but still at a very nascent stage in yeah. India as well. Uh, my last question, actually, I think we feared a, <laughs> to very many ways away from your novel, yeah. Season of Crimson Blossoms. Uh, and uh, I really like the fact that uh, you, are, you are, in a way, trying to do many things in the novel. Mm -hmm. But one of the things is the, is, is, is the way you sort of treat violence, but which is, which is treated with a certain, la with, with layers. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, I mean, there, there are relationships formed between the person who's trying to uh, uh, attack you, yeah. you, one character, and then that person feels remorse. Mm -hmm. And then there's a conversation, and then something else happens. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you think that this is, this is something that the fictional space offers you, unlike your, say, report of, say, Boko Haram did this, 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 this. Would you know, I, I think there's, uh, there are layers to every action you see. Every act has context. And uh, in most cases, people don't see the context, they just see the act, which is very unfortunate. But that is the way um, the things are projected. Uh, for me to write a story like this, you know, I have to take cognizance that I'm writing about contemporary in Nigeria and a contemporary place in Nigeria, um, which means I have to be honest and sincere about the depiction. So to pretend that there is no violence, that there is no communal crisis, that people are not being killed, would be dishonest, you know. So it was really important to project that, yes, this things happen, they are the background for some people, you know, I mean, Binta came from a very violent background. Her husband was killed in a communal violence. Um, she met, she met um, her lover in a very unusual way, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, these things have to reflect. But then again, this is not the dominant narrative of our people and our continent, mm -hmm. you know. I have suffered violence myself. I don't go about saying, oh, I'm, I'm I was dispossessed, or I lost my property, or I lost this, or I lost friends, or whatever, or, or that I was shot by people I knew. You know, these things happened. We've engaged with them. Maybe some of us have moved on. Maybe some of us haven't. That is a reality. So for me, this is sort of a post-violence uh, narrative, you know. I wasn't really interested in engaging with, OK, this is what happens or happened in Jaws, 
which which did happen for 10 years you know people were being killed and absolutely no one has been prosecuted for for those crimes that were committed but then again in the margins you have people who have suffered this violence who have survived it and who are trying to piece together their lives and I was really interested in these people. What are they doing? How is this background they are coming from influencing how they, they live now and how they project their future? Uh, and for me, that was a very, very important thing to talk about. And there's just so many references to what you're saying and with some of the situations here in India where yeah. several rights have, communal rights have taken place yeah. and I mean, the rate of conviction has been very, very dismal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it was an absolute. Well, at least you have a rate of, a rate of conviction. No, but which means it's probably uh, there yeah. have been a few convictions. But probably. it's like so dismal that uh, anyway. But that that's probably another interview and another conversation. <laughs> and uh, awesome. but thank you, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sandeep. It's thank a pleasure you. speaking to you. Thank you. So thank much. you. And thank you very much for watching. Uh, please make sure that you uh, uh, see some of the other interviews that we've done as part of this series. Uh, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, keep following our website www.indianculturalforum.in for more such stories. Thank you so much for watching.